Another uh, non-idality is phase and frequency instability. We're not going to talk a great deal about this, but you should realize that um, the oscillators that we use aren't perfect. And so there's two things that aren't perfect about them. The first one is the fact that the frequency is not um, fixed in time, and it actually drifts over time. And it's not a small, it's not a, it's not a large drift. It would be uh, maybe a few fractions of a percent. Um, drifting might happen because you're holding the phone with your, your hand and you're heating it up or you're out in the sun or it's cold. And so temperature is one of the biggest uh, causes of frequency drift. The other one is phase noise. And um, in the um, frequency domain, if this is our local oscillator, what phase noise is, it's basically little sidebands because this is moving back and forth uh, just ever slightly. And its change is happening because the phase of the signal is changing randomly. And every time there's a phase change, there's a slight frequency change. Now, this is probably beyond what we're used to thinking about in terms of frequency domain for this course. But what I'm going to do is show you what it looks like in the time domain if we had a um, a clock with phase noise. And so imagine I have a clock running through time. Okay. And these edges in time move back and forth. So I've got a certain amount of uncertainty here. And this is called jitter. And I think physically jitter is just a little bit easier to understand. If you have a clock edge that cycle to cycle, it might not land exactly at the period T that you're hoping for. And that variation from where that clock edge lands is jitter, and it's the dual of phase noise um, for a sinusoid. And this happens just actually from the thermal noise in the oscillators, and it's one of the fundamental limitations of oscillator and one of the fundamental specifications in looking for an oscillator is what is the phase noise um, for that. And so let's just take a, a little bit of a look what happens when this LO is degraded by phase noise. Um, the impact in the final constellation is basically a blurring. And so you'll see that it moves around the constellation. Now, uh, when I say blurring, it's not like a dot that becomes bigger in all directions. That would be just additive white noise. This is still going to follow the trajectory, but it's going to move back and forth along the trajectory. And once again, if we have a receiver trying to find that dot, um, the receiver box needs to be big enough so that it contains the entire span of what is going to uh, happen. And then finally, um, typically in a transmitter we need quite a bit of gain, uh, 20 to 30 dB. And that's because we're generating the baseband signals with very low power and we want to transmit with enough power to reach a final destination. Um, one thing about gain in a transmitter or a receiver that's a little bit different is that because the amplitude of the signals coming in can vary um, depending on where the system is, we often need uh, an adaptive gain. Uh, this is not only to level the signals in a transmitter or receiver, but also could be so that we need to uh, boost power or the amplitude of the signal. So one thing we'll find a lot, particularly in receivers, is an adaptive gain um, to adjust the uh, signal level. And for the transmitter, we're going to need adaptive gain to uh, adjust for the transmitted power. And just a, a side note here is uh, it's pretty difficult to provide high frequency amplification. Um, and it's something we have to do, but typically we try to amplify as much as we can at the lower frequencies and then simply upconvert. But we do have to amplify um, at the, uh, uh, at the uh, RF frequency, if you will, um, for a lot of architectures also.